there's a two two main defects would be the excavatum, where the chest is sort of excavated or carved out, or um, the carinatum, where the breastbone sort of comes up like this. Those are sort of the two classic extremes. But a lot of kids are somewhere in the middle, where part of their chest actually sticks out, part of their chest sticks in. Oftentimes, it's because of this asymmetry that, you know, one part of their sternum, the sternum is rotated, the breastbone is rotated, and that results in, in this sort of defect. <coughs> Oftentimes, these are the most difficult to treat, where these others would actually have uh, pretty good uh, treatment options available. We're not totally sure what causes the defect. Um, the sort of the leading theory is that as kids grow, you know, if you look around the room, sort of, you know, uh, adolescent, often, most oftentimes boys, but there's this period of rapid growth. And the thought is that as is, is the children are growing, that it crowds out the chest. And so the part of the chest that's actually most flexible is kind of these blue, bluish gray things, and that's the cartilage that connects the ribs to the sternum. And so as the chest is getting crowded out, you know, the sternum sort of pops forward or, or it sinks in. <coughs> One thing that would maybe argue against that is that some kids are actually born with this. So some kids are actually mostly, most commonly with the sunken chest, but also with the chest that sticks out. And sometimes that'll get a little bit better. But for the most part, you know, we think that, that because of this period of rapid growth, <coughs> that these flexible parts um, sort of allowing the, the chest to just either come out or come in is really kind of the, the main problem. We have no way of really proving that other than just kind of observation. Um, so we say that most of these are, are sporadic, meaning that they occur randomly. But you know, you know, there does seem to be a genetic predisposition. A lot of times we'll get kids in and say, oh, my dad had this, or I've got uncles that, that have had this problem. So we do see, you know, we do see that it runs in families. It's most definitely more common in boys than in girls. And sometimes it's associated with some syndromes. This Marfan syndrome, you know, oftentimes the boys are really tall, and um, a lot of the kids will be sent to us saying, you know, with the thought that maybe they, they look like maybe they have Marfan syndrome. They're tall, big hands, broad shoulders. Um, but the truth is it's only a very small fraction of the kids with a chest wall malformation will have Marfan syndrome. But just what's important to know about Marfan syndrome is, you know, it can be related with some heart problems. So if there's any concern, we should really kind of take a look at the heart and make sure that there isn't any problem there. This Poland syndrome is much more common in girls, and it's, and it's really quite obvious. And so it, it's not really much of a mystery whether you have Poland syndrome or not. So if there's <coughs> one thing that I want you to remember from today is that having a pectus defect, whether it's your chest coming out or your chest going in, is not dangerous. You're not going to die from it. It's not going to hurt your heart. It's not going to hurt your lungs. You can have a perfectly normal life without really doing anything to treat it. Okay. <coughs> you might say, then, why do we treat it? As I'll, as I'll show you in a moment, there is some evidence to suggest that there may be a little bit of an improvement in how the heart and lungs work. But it's not sort of the type of problem that's going to make it so you can't have a normal life. It's really just sort of the type of problem where it might actually improve your exercise capacity a little bit. The other thing that, and I think is a really compelling reason, some people say, so has it been just a cosmetic thing? I, I don't think that that's really, that's not the way I would phrase it. I would rather say that, you know, some of the kids, this really affects the way they view themselves, it affects their self-esteem, the way they relate to other people and the world. And so, <clears throat> for some kids, it's a really powerful thing sort of feeling that they're different in this way. And, and, and so it's not just a, a cosmetic thing, but I think sort of a, a, has an impact on their psyche. And I think that that's, um, it's important to pay attention to that. Um, and, and I think that that is, can be a compelling reason for some kids to undergo an operation or bracing to fix this problem. Okay. I'm first gonna talk about pectus carinatum. Um, <coughs> I don't know if this applies to him any of you guys in the room. Um, but I think it's sort of instructive because it, it, it sort of influences how we treat both of the problems. So with the carinatum or this pigeon breast, you know, I don't know how big the high schools are where you get kids go to school, but you know, if there's a few thousand kids in your school, there's at least probably two or three kids in the school with this problem. 
it tends to get worse with age, but then it stabilizes. So it gets worse until you stop growing, and then once you stop growing, it, it, it sort of stays that way. It, it's not the sort of thing that's going to get worse and worse and worse than by the time you're, you know, into your 40s here. <coughs> Usually it just stops once you stop growing. The best way to treat it is with bracing, just like you'd, you know, you'd straighten your teeth out with, with braces. We can make a, bre uh, a, a brace that you can wear on your chest. And, um, and usually we reserve an operation as a last resort, either where the bracing has failed or where the kids are just sort of too old for it. One of the important things about this treating with bracing early is that those, those little blue things that I showed you, the cartilage, <coughs> Early in life, they're actually really soft and flexible. My kids are tiny, they're five and seven, and horse around with them, tickle them, and you know, they got these sort of springy little chests. As you get older, that gets more rigid. And so if you're, you know, if you're sort of into young adulthood, into your 20s, oftentimes then it's difficult to brace because that part is much more rigid and, um, and we just can't get enough force to change the shape of the chest. <laughs> and, and that also actually has an impact on uh, when we treat the other problem, when the chest is sort of hollowed out, or the excavatum. These are a couple different types of braces. Um, this is the brace that we most commonly use here. So somebody, uh, this guy Daryl, he's really skilled at making these. Uh, the ones that he's been making lately are, are just slightly different. They're a little bit lower profile. You can see there's this little gel pad here, which we press on the sternum. This brace that comes around the back. <coughs> and I spent some time in Argentina, and this is a brace that one of the guys that I was working with had, had developed. What was sort of unique about his is that he's got this little pressure device, and you can sort of try and figure out how much pressure it takes to push the sternum in, and with that, maybe kind of predict how successful the treatment will be. I don't use that brace that much here, just because, you know, since it comes from Argentina, sometimes there's so just, you know, difficulties with insurance companies. But this is a kid that Marcel and I treated down in Argentina. It's hard to really take the photographs of this. But, you know, after just, a, I think, six weeks or so, this is a relatively young kid, but his chest flattened out and a really good result. Um, this is a paper that Marcelo published, the guy that I was working with down there. And basically, he divided the kids into three groups based on how hard we had to push on the chest to get it to change shape. Um, and you can see that you know the kids that needed less force were generally younger, so kind of 11, 13, and 15. <clears throat> and the less force that was needed, usually the happier the kids were on a scale of 1 to 10. And usually they needed treatment for a shorter period of time. So the long and the short of it is, is that if you're younger and your chest is, is sort of softer and more elastic, the bracing is more likely to work, and it's more likely to work uh, more quickly. And that's a permanent fix? So even though you only uh, he wore the device for six weeks, and you've jumped well, back with him? And so that kid wore the device for about six weeks, and he had a pretty rapid change in, in the shape of his chest. Mm -hmm. Usually, that, so the idea is that you wear the brace as much as possible, and you tell the kids to wear it all the time, with the exception when you're playing sports or bathing. So that means sleeping in it. Mm -hmm. Some of the kids have a tough time doing that. And some of the kids don't want to wear it to school. Once we actually change the shape of the chest, mm -hmm. we sort of go more towards this, um, like a retainer strategy, yeah, that's where we have the them wear it maybe at night or wear it during the day. And it's hard to know really how long they should wear that. Uh, you know, we can sort of tell once we get it to the shape that we want. And part of it is that um, a lot of it depends on where the kids are with their growth. Mm -hmm. and so it tend to kind of come back as they grow. Mm -hmm. The thing is, you can just sort of keep an eye on it. It's not like an operation where we had to remove the brace. You can just sort of keep an eye on their brace and if it's in their chest, and if it seems like it's starting to change shape, mm -hmm. if that brace still fits them, we can replace it, or if not, we can fit them for a new brace. Mm -hmm. So usually, um, what to expect would be, you know, somewhere a period of you know three to six months, probably of pretty continuously wearing it. <coughs> And then after that, this retainer period can last somewhere between, you know, months to years. So it's pretty much until the cartilage hardens. Yeah, okay. yeah, I think so. The, the thing, though, is, you know, if you, so you say, well, so you're going to start bracing somebody at 10 years old. Does that mean you're going to leave them in a brace for the next six years? Mm -hmm. That's sort of tough. So I don't know. I, I think that when the kids really want 
and when it really starts to bother the kids is really sort of when I do it. I prefer to do it sort of earlier in the teenage years if possible, you know, mm -hmm. around the time they're 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. I think their chest is still fairly elastic then. Mm -hmm. um, and then once we get their chest to where we want it, I pretty quickly go to that retainer strategy just because it's sort of tough on the kids to have to wear the brace all the time and march to school. And, you know, sometimes in the summertime, we'll just give them a, a reprieve and not make them wear all summer if they're in the pool and stuff. Okay. The way it usually works is that <coughs> if you're interested in the brace, Daryl can usually get you in to get you measured today. And then uh, you got to come back and make sure when he'll make the brace. You come back, you make sure it's fitted properly. And then usually we see you every, uh, every couple of months. And Daryl and I will usually alternate. You know, he'll see you guys and I'll, and I'll see you. Just to make sure that things are going okay. But the most important thing is that, you know, if you don't wear the brace, it just doesn't work. If it fits sitting in the back of the closet, it's not going to do anything. Um, for kids whose chests are either too stiff or bracing fails, either because the kids were too old and the chest was stiff or, you know, for whatever reason the kids just didn't wear it, there is an operation that we can do and that's called the ravage. <coughs> I'll talk about that in just a moment because it's an operation that we can use to treat both problems. Um, either whether your chest is in or your chest is out. So with the excavating problem, where the chest is sunken in, we think it's a bit more common, but um, actually as we sort of started treating kids with bracing, with this sort of less invasive approach with the bracing, it seems like I probably see equal amounts of the two problems. I think it just there's a little bit more awareness that this carinata can be treated. It also tends to get worse with age and then stabilizes. But really the operation is a main treatment, and there's a couple different different techniques that we can use. Um, so pectus excavatum comes in sort of many different shapes. And so, I don't know, I put this picture up here and sometimes kids are like, oh, that's what that chest looks like. Um, <coughs> this is a young boy with the, with the excavatum. And this might actually get better with time. Not always, but sometimes in the little babies that are born with it, sometimes it'll get better. And these teenagers, though, that, you know, people talk about doing exercise or swimming and doing things like that, but um, none of those things have really been proven to change the shape of the chest. It really requires a lot of force to get this to come out. Um, what I would point out is this kid here, for example, is pretty classic. You can see it in this boy a little bit, too. But um, his shoulders are sort of slumped forward. I think that's in part because of the way their chest is shaped. But I think also in part because the kids often try and hide this a little bit. So by slumping their shoulders forward, I think they, they think it's less obvious. There's also this problem here of uh, rib flare, where the ribs tend to stick out at the bottom. That's really typical. But then there's these different sort of amounts of, of, of sunkenness. This I would say is more like a trough, or this we say is like a little teacup. Almost looks like somebody put their fist in there. <coughs> and um, and this is really bothersome to some of the kids. Um, in the 70s, there was a surgeon in, in, in Columbia, his name was Dr. Haller, and he was trying to figure out how we could say, how we could quantify how severe the defect was. He initially did this with um, plain x-rays. The way we usually do it now is with a CT scan. So we have a way of doing CT scans here where it's a low dose of radiation. We don't need to see the heart and lungs super clearly with high resolution. We just kind of want to see the bones. So the CT scan we do here is equivalent of about a couple chest x-rays, where a high resolution CT scan can be 50 or 100 x-rays worth of radiation. So it's a, it's a low amount of radiation. And um, so this is like if the child were here laying on the flat with their feet coming out towards you. So this is the right side to left. This is the spine. This is the sternum here. This is a kid without pectus excavatum. And what Dr. Haller did is he took measurements of how wide the chest is compared to how deep it is. And most people, their chest is about two to two and a half times as wide as it is deep. Um, with the kids that have the excavatum defect, this number gets smaller and smaller. So it gets closer to be like three times as wide or four times as wide. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Haller sort of randomly said, back in the 70s, you know, if they have a Haller index of above 3.5, you can have a seat. Welcome. Um, if you have a Haller index of above 3.2, he said, I would usually consider treating something like that. 
that wasn't based on really anything other than just sort of his eye saying, like, that kid looks like he's got a bad problem. So it wasn't like he was able to demonstrate that it had some ill effect on the heart or on the lungs. Just he thought that those people should have an operation. So we're kind of stuck with that a little bit, or some insurance companies are sort of hung up on that idea. So, you know, we'll get a CT scan to try and quantify how, how severe the defect is. And um, sometimes I've seen kids who have a really high Haller index, meaning it's really sunken in, at least when you look at them, but the number isn't so impressive for whatever reason. So sometimes we just have to either take photographs or write to the insurance company and document that this is you know, something that the, the child really wants to have done and, and sort of justify it. And usually we can get around it. I'll point out a couple other things. There's one that um, when the heart normally is shifted a little bit towards the left, but as the sternum sinks in, the, chest, the, lung gets pushed, the heart gets pushed over further and further towards the left, you think that that would have a really sort of adverse effect on how the heart functions. It turns out that it doesn't all that much. You know, when people have done heart ultrasounds, cardiac echoes, during the operation, you can see that the heart is shifted. And if you did an EKG, you can see that the EKG would be slightly different. But in absolute terms as to how, how well the heart functions, it doesn't seem like it has all that much of an effect. One thing that it can do is that the, the valves in your heart um, can get deformed. One of them in particular, the tricuspid valve, can get deformed. So if we hear a murmur at all, that's one of the things that we need to interrogate. The other thing that people um, worry about is, so what effect is it having on the lungs? And <clears throat> it turns out well, you do maybe lose a little bit of lung volume, but if you think about it, a little teacup size of volume compared to the sort of almost you know two or three liters of lung volume altogether really isn't that much of a change in the lung volume with having this. So if you were to pop the chest out, you don't gain all that much volume. Um, and the other thing is that most of your breathing is with the diaphragm getting pulled down. Not so much your sternum coming in and out, but the breathing muscle coming down. So as it turns out, you know, having this isn't, um, it isn't life-threatening. And people have done lots of tests, and some people said that it seemed like it had a, you know, fixing this had a good effect on, on how kids' lungs and heart function. Um, the last study that was published about a year and a half ago, which I think was probably the best study, um, measured something called VO2 max, which is your, a combination of how your heart and lungs are working, your ability to extract oxygen from the blood, it's the sort of thing that you'd see like Lance Armstrong doing with the, you know, all that stuff on his face and riding a bicycle. It's kind of one of the ways that they measure uh, how good of a sort of aerobic shape you're in. And it looks like there was probably about a 10% increase. And the reason I think that this test, this, this particular study was, was good is it was, it was very big, it was well done, and it was done at a bunch of centers. I think it was 11 centers around the country. So it wasn't sort of skewed towards just a single institution's bias. And, uh, and it showed probably about a 10% increase. So that's not going to, I don't know, I don't know if it'll make you tip you over the edge to become an Olympic athlete, but it's a small incremental increase. And now some of the kids will say, I feel so much better, I can play soccer now, I can keep up with other guys. Some of it might actually be truly physiologic, some of it also might just be the way they feel about themselves and just in general. So, um, <clears throat> but. So while I do think there is there is probably some a real impact on how your heart and lung functions, I don't want to overstate that. Some people will say you absolutely need to do this. You can. People used to think that your lungs would get trapped and wouldn't develop properly. That's not the case. Okay. So what are the treatment options? <clears throat> I'll go back to this this ravage operation. Uh, that's the older operation that people have been doing for, probably for about 50 years. And they can treat either when the sternum is out or when the sternum is in. Okay. So <clears throat> even though the whole chest has a little bit of unusual shape, usually, the thing that, that's most bothersome to the kids is where the sternum is, where this bone is here. And so um, Dr. Ravage is a, another surgeon. What he, what he 
sort of proposed is that maybe if you could remove what connects the ribs to the sternum, these cartilage, then you can actually move the sternum to where you want it. And what's more is that rather than just taking out the whole, whole cartilage, um, if you actually make a little cut in the cartilage and just take out the inside of it, yet preserve the sheath around it, something called the, the perichondrium, if you can save that, the cartilage will actually grow back. And so, so usually what we wind up doing then is we make a little cut here in the skin and we find these cartilage. We remove them, yet save the lining. And then we can either push the sternum in or pull the sternum out and fix it in place. It's a big operation. <coughs> it's kind of a lot of work, a lot of dissection to remove all those. And also the idea of removing some of the cartilage is just not all that appealing. But the operation works really well, and it works for treating both types of defects. Um, this is an old picture. I need to get a new one. This is an operation that I did when I was in fellowship with one of my bosses. I make the incision a little bit different shape, but this is sort of the kind of cut that, that you have. And these little poke holes here is a little drain. It's almost like a little tube so that fluid doesn't accumulate here. Um, you know, the operation takes several hours. The kids are usually in the hospital for about a week. Um, and it's really pretty well tolerated. One of the nice things about this is that, you know, probably by about six months, everything is pretty well healed. So, um, you know, if kids would want to play contact sports, I had a kid that was a wrestler and really wanted to get back to wrestling. This is the operation I did for him. The other operation that we do, which I'll talk about in a while, I really try to have the kids lay off for a while, just because, um, um, I'll explain why. But this operation works really well uh, for, for both, both problems. The other people that I'll do this operation for are kids who are older, so where the chest is really, really stiff, and you can't either apply a brace, or you can't change a shape with a, with a bar. Um, I'll do this operation, because I think it's just, it's a little bit better tolerated. Um, if you've read anything about pectus excavatum, you've probably heard about the NUS procedure. Um, so Dr. Nuss worked in Virginia, I think he, he actually passed away just recently, but um, while everybody was doing the ravage, <coughs> back in the late 80s and early, actually it was I guess the 90s, he had this idea that maybe he could treat the problem differently and he was just doing this for a while and then he presented this at one of the big pediatric surgery meetings and sort of changed the way we think about treating these problems. And the idea that he had, or the real epiphany I think that he had, is it one, if he could treat it sort of like with braces, if he could change the shape of the chest and hold it there, eventually he could take the brace away and the chest would stay where it is, just like you do with your teeth. The other thing is that, you know, when you have this center part sunk in, there's these higher parts. And if you could almost think of like a crowbar that sort of pushes up against this higher part, like a stone, and lifts lift the sternum up and out of that place, um, that would be very effective. So sort of putting these two things together, he thought, maybe if I could slide a little bar in behind the sternum and raise it, it would stay there. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have had braces. But, you know, when you get the braces on and they tighten them just a little bit, it, your mouth is sort of sore. Imagine if you went to the orthodontist and they put your braces on and they change the shape of your mouth all in one day or a lot. And so the, 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 the biggest downfall of this operation is that they change, we change the shape of your chest all at once, and it hurts a lot. So even though the cuts are tiny, you know, we do it with a little camera and stuff, the incisions aren't very big at all, but it hurts a lot just because we're changing the shape of your chest all at once. Okay. Um, <coughs> here's another little just sort of cartoon drawing of it. Now, you remember back on the CT scan, that white blob that was right here? That's your heart. And so we got to figure out a way to sneak this bar between your sternum, the bone, and your heart. Um, when Dr. Nuss first started doing it, which was totally, I don't know, crazy, but, um, <laughs> you know, risky, he'd just sort of do it blindly. He'd make two little holes in the chest and just sort of by feel, he'd kind of never in that space. What we do now is we put a little camera on either side so that we can watch the bar going across and see where the heart is. And it makes it much, much safer. 
there are still some reports of heart injuries. And it's something that is still, you know, just makes me lose sleep. I, I lose sleep for a lot of reasons these days. Just a lot of responsibility. But, um, but using the cameras made the operation much, much safer. Um, <coughs> because it requires so much force to change the shape of the chest, and that bar is under a tremendous amount of force, I don't, I, I want the kids to lay off playing sports <coughs> until everything is really healed up and until there isn't so much force being put placed on the bar. So usually, you know, I'll have the kids at least six months for sports and then at least a year for contact sports, you know, if the kids are playing um, field hockey or uh, lacrosse, football, things like that. Some people have them lay off contact sports altogether. Um, um, I think that maybe there's there's probably a little bit higher risk of the bar shifting when the kids are getting back to, to the sports and more sort of robust activity. On the other hand, the kids have to be kids and to sort of deny them all that part of their life. Um, I don't know. I, I, maybe I'm a little bit more lenient than other surgeons that you might talk to. But for the, the contact sports, it, it's definitely a year. Actually, I had one kid who wasn't playing contact sports, but just what he was doing. He was a rower, and so it was a lot of this type of motion, and, it, and the bar actually shifted. Uh, he, he was great about laying off, but I think it was just so much repetitive motion like this. So I don't think it's just the contact. Sometimes I think like if you're swinging a tennis racket or, or a golf club or something like that, it, um, it might make me a little bit more worried. But I mean, this kid was rowing for you know, three hours a day, every day. I mean, <laughs> um, this is sort of what the bar looks like. These little metal things on the end <coughs> are um, stabilizers, uh, just to try and make it so that the bar is less likely to shift. Um, sometimes we'll give you a little x-ray, you know, if you get stopped at the airport, you can show them I got something inside me. <laughs> <coughs> this is the way I operate it on, you know, it's two little incisions here. Um, and I think he had a really good correction. Um, you know, I think if, if you look at some kids with a real critical eye, you might say, oh, well, this part's still a little bit lower, the sternum isn't quite right. Um, some of that has to do with how the child shape is to start. If the sternum is really twisted, sometimes it's hard to straighten it out completely. But um, I think the, the, the difference of from where a lot of these kids start to where they end um, is most kids are actually really happy, and you know, probably over 90% of the kids are, are, are very satisfied with their care. So um, maybe I can just go over what to expect. So usually preoperatively, you know, we'll wind up getting a CT scan. I usually don't get a CT scan just to see how bad things are. I usually only get a CT scan if we're planning on doing an operation, because in my mind, I don't, I'm not operating for the CT scan. I'm operating because it's the child is having some symptoms or it's really bothering the child. But just to get the CT scan to kind of see where things stand, I don't usually do that. Some parents really want that or some of the kids want to see. And I'll, I'll, I'll agree to it, but that's not usually part of, part of my plan. The, if the uh, patient decides they want to do an operation, we usually do it in the summer. So really kind of the busiest time is at the beginning of the summer or at the beginning of winter break. Um, and the reason for that is it takes a while to recover from the operation so that the kids don't miss so much school. Um, with the operation, you're totally asleep, so you don't feel or remember any of it. Usually put an epidural in, so sort of like the um, often used for operations or women when they're in labor. It's a little bit higher though, but we want it to cover your chest, not down low. Uh, that goes in when you're asleep. Um, because of that epidural, it makes it hard to pee, so you got a pee tube in. You know that stays in for a few days. The operation takes, you know, probably about two and a half hours. Um, you wake up with a little incision on both sides. Sometimes there's an extra little poke hole, just where I put the camera if I can't get it off through the same incision. Um, and then with the hospitalization, you know, the epidural, the goal would be to try and get you up out of bed the first day after the operation. Two days after the operation, you know, my goal is to have the kids walking in the hallway. But on average, I think the kids are in the hospital for about a week. Um, I think it'd be unusual for a kid. Sometimes they go home as soon as five days, but that's pretty unusual. I've had some kids stay closer to 10 days. 
Um, but it's mostly, most of those kids, it's because we give you so much medicine to help control the pain that that medicine can make you really constipated. One of the things you got to do before you go to the hospital is poop. Um, you know, it sounds like a little bit weird. You usually will start by giving you something by mouth. If that doesn't work, so you put something in your butt to help you poop. <laughs> but um, I've just had kids go home and then come back just miserable for them to be able to have a bowel movement. So, um, uh, and it's just important to know that all these things could, could potentially happen to you when you're in the hospital. So after about a week in the hospital, you know, <clears throat> I think by about three weeks, most of the kids are off the strong pain medications. We usually send you home on a few different things, ibuprofen, some oral narcotics, and something like morphine. And about three weeks, you're off of that. Um, by about a month, kids feel better and they're, you know, might, might be up for going on vacation. They're able to dress themselves more comfortably and move more comfortably. And by about three months, the kids definitely feel like the operation is behind them. So, um, as I said, you know, no sports for six months, no contact sports for a year. And then the timing of removing the bar, that operation is, uh, is um, much less risky. It's much less painful. Usually it's a come and go procedure. Sometimes the kids will maybe spend one night, but usually they go home the same day. Um, and, <coughs> you know, people used to leave the barn for just one year. It turns out that probably wasn't enough, you know, because about 25% of kids recurred. People have pushed it more to two or three years. I tend to favor three years because once if the bar's in, it usually doesn't then bother the kids after they've healed. So I think if we leave it in for the extra year and it doesn't really have any impact, if they're going away for college or moving far away or it's hurting them, I'll take it out sooner, but I usually favor three years. The other question that I think the jury is still out on, but is what's the best age to operate on? Um, we had a, somebody come talk to us, a visiting professor come from Korea, and he was operating on kids that are five and six years old. I think that's way too young. I, I, but he says, you know, if you can change the shape of their chest, it can, most of them will stay there even after you take out the bar. Um, I think, in my mind, you know, both for the bracing as well as for the operation, um, the person that should really be, um, the person that should be most invested in it, you know, it's kind of one of the first decisions you'll make as a young adult, is whether this is something you want to do. Um, it affects you, you benefit from it. Uh, but you're also the one that either has to wear the brace or has to have the operation and go through the recovery. So I think it's really kind of something that the, that the kids really need to want. Um, you know, they're still kids, and so your parents and I talk about it, and we talk about the risks and whether it's the right thing for you. But I would never operate on a kid if it's something that the kid didn't want. The parents said, I really want it for my son or daughter, but the kid wasn't into it. I'd say, let's just wait and see. So the right age to operate on it, on, on a kid. <clears throat> the earliest I usually operate is 12. Um, I have operated on somebody as young as 10 and they had a really, really severe pectus and it was seemed like it was getting worse. I just thought the operation was going to get harder and harder as that kid got older. But the earliest I usually do is 12. My preference is probably somewhere around um, you know, 14 to 16 years old. The idea is if I put the, break, the bar in then, I'll take it out when they're about 17 years old. And most kids have done 90% of their barring by that age. Um, if we wait too long, <coughs> the chest tends to get really rigid. So I, I, I have and will do this operation in people in their 20s. I won't do it in, in the operation in people in their 30s or older than that anymore. Because um, it just, it's too painful. Their chest is too stiff. I've had patients where I had to remove the bar early because they just couldn't, couldn't tolerate it. So um, it's the sort of thing where you don't have to decide this is something you want today. For most of you, you probably have years ahead of you to decide if this is the right thing for you. Um, but usually somewhere between 14 and 16. 17, 18, it's not that much of a difference, but, but if I had a preference, I'd say, you know, around that 14 to 16 year. Mike Harrison, who's one of the, um, uh, the professor emeritus here, he doesn't operate anymore, but he had this idea that maybe we could sort of, um, how can you pull up on the chest and sort of do like kind of the bracing strategy, but it's sort of hard to imagine putting a 
fish hook in your chest and have that stick out of you. <laughs> um, so he had this idea that maybe you could put a little magnet in. So he developed this magnet that you can, it requires an operation to place. We put a magnet in under the skin and it's strapped to the sternum. And then on the outside, we put a brace. We make a brace, and that also has a magnet. And, and the thought is that it can exert enough force that slowly we can pull the sternum up over time with much less pain, because the kind of the biggest drawback of the NUS operation is the post-operative pain. And this is sort of what the brace looks like. Um, is that a couple trials? Mostly they're trials for safety, not, not necessarily trials to demonstrate how effective it is. Initially, he had kids of lots of different ages. The most recent trial we did was restricted to kids that were 13 and under. The thought being that those kids, their chest is a lot softer and uh, a lot more likely to change shape. I, <clears throat> though I don't have you know, sort of hard evidence to prove it, I think that this would be uh, unlikely to be successful in somebody that was you know, 16 years old. I think that by that point, their chest is almost still too rigid to the amount of force that you can really exert with a magnet is kind of limited. So the jury's still out on this. <coughs> we just filled a, a trial uh, last summer, and so we need to wait two years and get all those magnets out. We still have I think, one more year to wait now and get those magnets out before we get full approval from the FDA to move forward. But um, So that's not available right now. A lot of you maybe read about it on our website, but, but that's not um, available at the moment just because we're waiting on um, the results of the trial. Okay.